We're about to get this session underway. Uh, we've titled this session, uh, the last session before lunch, The Consequences of Inaction in Syria, and we've got a great set of speakers. Uh, before I uh, turn it over to Bob Kagan, I just want to remind everyone that you can follow us uh, today on Foreign Policy I uh, on Twitter, and we're using the hashtag FPI Forum if you want to tweet uh, questions, and we'll take a number of questions. Uh, from Twitter and from uh, people watching on C-SPAN. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robert Kagan, who's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and also one of uh, FPI's board of directors. So, Bob? Thank you, Jamie, and uh, thank you all for uh, being here um, to discuss this uh, extremely important topic. Um, I must say my own view of things is that if the French are ready to go, we should go. <laughs> I, that, that's, that's my rule of thumb in foreign policy. Uh, and in that regard, I think it's both mystifying and shameful uh, that the Americans are so far behind uh, on this issue uh, that they uh, are once again letting the French uh, lead the way. But I, I wish I could, I was more confident that the Americans were actually following in this case. Uh, but in any case, that'll be the, the subject of our discussion today, Syria what to do, uh, why we aren't doing more, uh, what outcomes we might want to see in Syria, what are the methods to get there. And it's, uh, it's uh, almost literally impossible to imagine uh, two people uh, better suited to having this discussion. Um, sitting next to me is our old friend, uh, uh, a living institution in the United States, um, the leader of foreign policy thought in the Senate, and I guess I would say in Washington, um, I won't go through his uh, whole distinguished biography because you all know Please Senator do so. John McCain. Well, <laughs> I'll save that. I'll do it afterwards or I'll send it around to anybody who wants to see it. But, um, it's really a pleasure to have you here again Thanks, at Bob. FBI. Um, and it's also a great uh, pleasure and honor um, to welcome Bernard Henri Lévy to. Uh, to FPI and to have this discussion. Um, he is also someone who needs no introduction, but I think uh, since American audiences may not be uh, as familiar as they ought to be, despite his best-selling book uh, about America called American Vertigo, which I think is based on the Hitchcock movie. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, uh, but he's also been, um, he's a philosopher, he's a thought leader, and he has put himself uh, frequently in harm's way uh, uh, in the most noble of causes. And one of his other books uh, is called La Guerre Sans Lame, which I believe translates to War Without Love, um, which is about his time in Libya, uh, which uh, was a kind of, it's a literary diary uh, inspired by his actions during the war in Libya. Um, uh, he's the ed director of a review called La Règle de Jeu, which I believe is called The Rules of the Game, which is based on the Renoir film. So it's a, there's a movie theme here. But in any case, um, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us to talk about Syria. Um, let me just start by asking Senator McCain, uh, because you're in, con in frequent contact with the U.S. administration, uh, there was some speculation, I think, I don't know what it was based on, uh, during the campaign that uh, President Obama and the administration in general were reluctant to take action on Syria while he was running for office on a theme of, uh, you know, the receding of war, um, and, and a hope and an expectation that after the election, uh, then they would begin to put some, uh, some steps in place. And we did have... Secretary Clinton and the, the effort to build a new uh, Syrian opposition group. Do you see a new movement in the administration on this issue? Well, I certainly saw a, uh, an effort to organize better the Syrian resistance and uh, Secretary Clinton and others in the administration played a very active role in that effort. I'm also hearing um, uh, from their usual source, where from they have send their information out through the New York Times, as you know, uh, <laughs> that uh, that we are now going back to try to convince the Russians to. Uh, I thought we'd fairly well exhausted uh, that avenue, uh, which was, of course, a blind alley to start with. Uh, but uh, I've still not seen in any indication that. The United States would take the active leadership role that, frankly, the entire Middle East is crying out for. 
I just, I just have not seen that yet. I hope it will happen. I pray that it will happen. We're now up to 40,000 uh, and climbing. And of course, uh, as all of these kinds of civil wars or conflicts go, they escalate and the atrocities get worse and the bombing and the things that were never contemplated or seen early in this uprising are now basically tactics of war. And the, the, the thing that bothers me more than anything else, Bob, I, I, I agree that someday Bashar Assad will fall. We've been saying that now for uh, 20 months, 20 months, something like that. Uh, but in the meantime, what carnage will take place between now and then? Because every time there seems to be a modest escalation on the side of assisting the resistance, there is an escalation by the Iranians, by the Russians, by the formation of this now uh, group. I've forgotten now what they call themselves, what paramilitary uh, organization they're trying to form up. So I, I kind of see steps of escalation with the resistance making some progress, but a long, long way from victory. The administration's, uh, you can't tell whether the administration's insistence on going to the Security Council and getting Security Council authorization is a way of being very sincere in its desire to get a Security Council authorization to move forward, uh, or whether it's a way of hiding behind the Security Council and not taking action. But let me ask you, Monsieur Levy, what, what did you, you know, in France, I think American, the American assumption is that the French would agree that you can't do anything without a Security Council resolution. I'm wondering what your view on that is, given that at the moment, and really for quite some time now, it seems very unlikely that the Russians uh, would approve uh, any serious action to overthrow a what is your view of, of how important it is to go to the Security Council, uh, whether we should be dis dissuaded if we can't get a resolution? Let me tell you first how, uh, just one word, how honored I am to sit next to Senator McCain. Uh, Senator McCain embodies for me and for many Frenchmen uh, one of the most noble things in the world, which is physical bravery, physical courage. And I remember uh, four years ago, I was very embarrassed. I had a vested interest in Barack Obama's campaign because I predicted four years before that he could be <laughs> an American president, so I, I was for him. But I had a real <laughs> embarrassment when I saw the, the performance and the, and the bravery of Senator McCain. And for me, it's a very, it's a big treat to be here with you and to discuss like you to with come you. out to Arizona with me sometime. About uh, 2016. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's the point I wanted to make. Um, about the United Nations, how important it is. Of course it would be great to have United Nations. Of course it would be better. But please, if United Nations was a moral authority, then it would be indis indispensable to have it. We could not do it without. But the United Nations has, uh, is so corrupt, morally corrupted. They accepted so many bloodbaths in the 20th century. They closed their eyes on Bosnia. They closed their eyes on Rwanda. We cannot take shelter under the, the veto of a uh, uh, Security Council in order not to do anything. This is really an alibi. It is an excuse. Um, there are a lot of people in France and in America who are very pleased of this veto. veto. It's a very comfortable to be able to say, we would love to go, but there is this moral authority, this Antigone law of a security Council. This is a, a, a joke. And what I can tell you um, is that I remember so well the first day uh, when Nicolas Sarkozy received the transitional authority of the Libyan people, the NTC, in Palais de l'Elysée. I was here. I took the three guys, Ali Zaidan, Prime Minister today, Mahmoud Jibril, Ali Alessawi, uh, to um, uh, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy's office. Nicolas Sarkozy exposed to them his plan to prevent the bloodbath in Benghazi. They were very happy, and one of them, uh, Ali Zaidan, asked, but Mr. President, what if you don't have the endorsement of United Nations? Nicolas Sarkozy made the following reply. 
he said, number one, I will have the endorsement because I'm very strong, I'm very uh, voluntary, I will have. But if I don't have the endorsement, I will do without. Because you have situations in history of humanitarian emergency where there is, of course, the laws, but also the law. And Sarkozy said, if ever by, by mischance I did not get the endorsement, then we would build, there is other organizations, regional, you have Arab League, you have uh, African Union, you have NATO, you have uh, uh, European Unions. I would build with my friend David Cameron, this is the, the, the quote of Nicolas Sarkozy this day, we will build a sort of substitutional, of legitimacy of substitution to deal with this moral emergency which we are facing. So it will be the same about Syria. If we can, of course. The proof is made that we are hijacked, that the human rights are hijacked by Mr. Putin, uh, the great democrat of Chechnya, <laughs> the man who uh, er erased um, uh, uh, three quarters of Grozny. He is entitled, apparently, to say what human rights is and what a uh, defense of human rights should be. This is a uh, 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 terrible joke. And we have to, I think, that the only decent way, thing to do would be to, to proceed without, uh, without that. And let me just ask you, just following up on that, what is your view of, because I asked Senator McCain, what is your view of American policy right now? I mean, how, what is your, what's your opinion of it, and also how do you explain it? My view on American policy, uh, in Libya, I think that um, America did well. France took the lead, but America did well. I, I think I had a few inside, uh, 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 an inside view of the story, and I can say that America was saved, the honor of America was saved by your president, of course, Obama, but by three women, three women. Samantha Power, Susan Rice, and Hillary Clinton. I, I, uh, I happen to be the one who took Mahmoud Jibril uh, to Paris on the, uh, in March, when there was this meeting of the G8, when Hillary Clinton was in Paris to see Nicolas Sarkozy and, Al and Alain Juppé. And Mahmoud Jibril, who was prime minister of, transitional prime minister of Libya, had a face-to-face -face meeting with ambas future Ambassador Stevens, Christopher Stevens, who was not yet ambassador. He was there. There was a meeting face-to-face -face between Jibril and Hillary Clinton. And my belief, and my feeling and my belief, is that a great deal of the story happened during these 45 minutes. There was a man, there was two, two persons, a man and a woman, a heart speaking to another heart, um, a, a great plea of Mahmoud Jibril addressed to a, to a mother, to a, to a humanitarian uh, uh, militant uh, who, who, is, who is Hillary Clinton. And when Jibril went out of the office, I think that Hillary Clinton was really impressed moved, then there was this uh, conversation uh, overseas between um, uh, Gates, uh, Clint, um, Clinton, and, and Obama, and so on. So Clinton, Rice, Samantha Power, they, they did a great job. And of course, President Obama and the, the whole administration followed very bravely. Today, about Syria, I must confess that I don't understand. Uh, during the campaign, one could understand. There was a special uh, uh, context, uh, there was the electoral fight, and so on. But now, what prevents? Opposite to what is generally said, it is more doable today against Assad than it was two years ago against Gaddafi. All those who tell us, but you can't say that, uh, uh, Syria is very difficult, very complicated, they, they, they lie. It is much doable. A war is never easy, and it, all, it is always tragic, and the collateral effects are always dramatic. But as, as soon as this is said, it is more doable today in Syria than it was doable yesterday in Libya. 
and I, I, I could explain why uh, later. Could I, could I make yeah. two, well. just two points? One is that uh, all the things that the non-interventionists said would happen if we intervened have now happened in Syria. The, the influence and dramatic increase in al-Qaeda presence, the escalation uh, of bombing, the tensions on the borders, all of the things that, that were predicted that would happen if we intervene are now happening and in spades. And again, it cries out for American leadership. But I think that we also must view this situation in Syria in the broader context of the entire upheaval that's taking place in the Middle East, and especially the role of Iran. Iran are the ones, the, the missiles that were in Gaza. It was uh, Iran who, send, who was sending in the Revolutionary Guards on the ground that are training this new paramilitary force. And believe me, in warfare, there's nothing more atrocious than these kinds of paramilitary uh, forces. It's the Iranians that continue to have the centrifuges spinning. It's the Iranians that are uh, even influencing al-Qaeda or other extremist groups throughout the region and continuing to provoke and to plot even assassinations here in our nation's capital. So I think when we look at Syria, we also have to look at the effect of the fall of Bashar on Iran and also what Iran will continue to do, not just in Syria, but, for example, Hezbollah in, in southern Lebanon. Suppose that they decide to trigger uh, these missiles, which would overwhelm Iron Dome. There's so many things moving parts in the region, and so much of it can be traced back to our, uh, our the, the number one uh, spoiler in the region uh, on top of the uh, Arab Spring, and that is the Iranian meddling in literally every part of the Middle East. Well, let's talk about then what, what should be done. What, what is your, what's your current view on what we ought to be doing? The no-fly zone, uh, which, by the way, does not mean that we go after Bashar's air defenses. It means that we in place anti-air missiles in place. And I guarantee you, first uh, Syrian aircraft we shot down, that would be the last one to fly over a, a no-fly zone. Let, a place where they can, a Benghazi a Benghazi where they can organize, where they can train, where they can equip, where we can find out who the good guys and the bad guys are in th this effort to form a revolutionary council that will be effective, and also, frankly, to counter what is the increasing influence of al-Qaeda and extremists who are pouring in from all over the Middle East. The longer this goes, the more likely we're going to have enormous challenges with these kinds of—it'll be the militias in Libya uh, magnified by a factor uh, of 10. So, so then, and then obviously it would be nice if we had the United Nations, but I really believe that one, Americans are war weary, no boots on the ground, no boots on the ground, no boots on the ground. But it could, we could prevail with the kind of equipment that they need and training and organization. They, right now they have no place to, to organize. Are you talking about giving uh, anti-aircraft weapons to the opposition? Or are you talking about emplacements in Turkey or what? Could, we could do some of the above. I think Patriot missiles, you know, as now the Germans are moving some Patriot missiles under some kind of weird circumstances, but at least they're coming into, into Turkey. Or we could uh, give them a limited number, a controlled number of man pads. Uh, but primarily, I think it would just be a Patriot uh, installation. Pilots are not going to fly into certain death. I don't care how brave they are. And you shoot down one or two of them, they're not going to fly there again. They may like Bashar Assad, but they like to live a little more. Is Turkey ready to play that role? Again, everybody I talk to in Turkey and in the region, it's, it cries out for American leadership. I think that the Turks are having significant public opinion problems. They're overwhelmed by huge numbers of refugees. They see this uh, thing con uh, continuing. We're going to have, it. my friends, the next big challenge in the Middle East is the ambitions of the Kurds for a Kurdish state. And the longer this kind of uh, situation prevails, the more that they're going to have their ambitions. They're in Syria, they're in Iraq, they're in Iran. They're, they're everywhere, they're in Turkey, uh, as you know. So um, 
I think that uh, it's, it's very obvious that we can, the sooner we get this thing moving in the right direction, the better. But I worry about Erdogan. I worry about his ambitions. I worry about his comments. He took himself out of the negotiations on the Gaza thing by his comments about Israel. Uh, there's the, one thing I can assure all of us, and that I'm totally confident of, is we didn't know what the world in the Middle East was going to look like two years ago, or a little over two years ago, when all these other guys were in power. We cannot predict what the world is going to be, Middle East is going to be like two years from now, except that it crossed out for American leadership. And that's what, in my view, and I hate to be partisan when I say this, but it is missing there. It is missing. And when I talk to all of these leaders, whether they be Gulf uh, leaders or any place else in the Middle East, they want American leadership. Do you have other thoughts you wanted to add to uh, to what ought to be done? And do you have a view as to whether, I mean, you know, if the administration, if an administration official were sitting here, they would say, A, Erdogan talks a good game, but he doesn't really want to do anything in Syria for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned, including the Kurdish thing. B, we don't want to give uh, anti-aircraft weapons to people because we don't know what happens to them after they've, after they've used them, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That all these things, I've heard the phrase non-star, everything's a non-starter, and that's why they go to the Security Council. You know, the, the question is not, uh, will Assad fall? Assad will fall. The question is, will Assad fall with the help of the West or without the help of the West? This is the crucial question. If Assad falls in a few weeks, in a few months, without the help of the West, then it will be an affair between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It will be a fight between uh, Qatar and uh, the allies of uh, guards of revolutions, and so on. If it is with the West, then, number one, we will do our duty, duty of Democrats. We will uh, have the flag of our values high. And number two, we will have our word to say in the future of, the, of this area. Look at what happens in Libya today. Egypt, Tunisia, Libya. It's a common place to say that things don't go so well in Egypt and in Tunisia, which is true. Muslim brothers are on power in Egypt. Women are not in such a good situation in Tunisia, and so on. Look at what happens in Libya. In Libya, the Muslim brothers lost the elections in last July. The secular and moderate Muslims won. The prime minister is Mr. Ali Zaidan, who is uh, uh, a true Libyan patriot, but who is also a friend of the West, a friend of Europe, a friend of America, a true human rights fighter. He was the president of the Human Rights League for 20 years and so on. So what is the difference between Libya on one side and Egypt and Tunisia on the other side? The difference, one of the differences is that the Libyans did the job with the help of the West. They know that the key argument of Al-Qaeda, which is the West is against us, the West is devil, America is the grand devil, and so on, is false. They know that the West is not the eternal ally of the dictators. And this reshaped completely the way of thinking of a lot of average people in Libya. The, 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 the grass has been cut under the feet of the Islamists and of the Al-Qaeda. The key argument was that, was the West is the enemy of the people. No, in Libya, the West was the friend of the people. They gave the hand and they were helpful. So the, in Syria, it is the same, but it is late. It is 40,000 dead too late. But nevertheless, it is still time. It is still time to show to the youth of Syria that we hear their appeal to liberty, that we are able to listen to their call for human rights. But let me just say about Libya. Everything you say, I totally agree with, except for the fact that we abandoned Libya, the light footprint. They needed all kinds of help, which they could pay for. 
They needed help with securing the borders. They needed help with setting up a, a, a police and army force. They needed to help, help with disarming these militias, which are still roaming around. We watched the deterioration in the eastern part of Libya. We watched it. We saw the threats to our embassy. We thought, saw the al-Qaeda elements coming in. Uh, ten uh, different uh, al-Qaeda-affiliated groups are, are uh, around Benghazi as we speak. We watched it happen because we didn't do the things that we knew were necessary to assist them to set up the first government that literally that they've ever had. And we obviously paid a very heavy price for it. And, and we watched great Ambassador Stevens being killed in such a savage way, uh, probably linked to what you are, you are saying. Of course, that is, that is true. That is true. But that is not a reason not to not to intervene. That is a reason to to change the move, even in Libya. I think that, for example, America. But could and I just say? I think that's why the follow-up is always so important. Help of course, the Syrians, of course, but then realize course, that course, the international community has a lot to do. Unfortunately, you are not yeah. in office. Yeah. I will never be. <laughs> but <laughs> if we were, uh, there is, for example, a project which I uh, I happened to to propose it recently to President Hollande. America could um, be a partner of that to build in Benghazi or in Tripoli a real um, institute. Of, uh, of leaders, of, uh, of building of leaders, uh, according to local views, of course, according to the, the, what is a Muslim country, but with democratic value. A sort of uh, national school of leaders uh, in a country where, uh, in Libya, you have 42 years without any state, without any civil society, and not, and not even a nation. So ground zero of policy. We could follow up, of course, for example, with that. We have in France a school called, called École Nationale d'Administration, Administration National School, something like that. This would be a great partnership between America and France, could be built in Benghazi. And I'm sure that they will take, that they would take. The, bank, the Libyan um, leaders would be more than happy of this sort of, um, of help. And they need a police force and an army. Well, I just want to follow up on that a little bit and pull back the lens uh, somewhat because uh, you know we, we have the honor of having you here and, and it gives us an opportunity to hear from you uh, how the U.S. is viewed these days, both in France and in the United and in the, and in Europe more broadly. Um, you know, you raised the question. You know, does the United States uh, are we working closely enough with Europe on these kinds of issues? Do you sense uh, a strong alliance? Is there a perception of uh, whether America America's on its way up or on its way down. It's just, I'm just curious to get your view uh, of how America appears right now. There is one thing which was noticed in, in, in Europe uh, in the acceptance speech of President Obama a few weeks ago, which is that the word Europe was not uttered once in his speech. He did not say uh, Europe. So I don't know, is that a bad, see, a bad sign or not? I leave it to Europe, I hope not. I hope the current administration knows that whatever is a stake on the, on the West, whatever is the emergency of dealing with Chinese uh, 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 things and so on, there is a link of flesh and of blood and of values between America and Europe. I hope this is well understood in America. In Libya, it seemed yes. I hope it will be in the next um, next situations. I don't know. I don't know. I understand our emphasis on the Asia Pacific region, the world's economy, China, all of those things. But you, the, when they use the word pivot, then that's a, a very serious error in my view. And I think it's kind of coincidental the president was in Asia when obviously Gaza and Israel were on the brink of an all-out uh, conflict. I, I think that 
I, I would strongly advise our national security people in the administration to say that we want to balance. We don't want to pivot. We want to balance. We understand that that Asia Pacific region is very important. God knows. Look at the Chinese just landed a aircraft on an aircraft carrier. There's no greater signal of a desire to have a nation that can project power than an aircraft carrier. I say that with some parochialism, obviously. But, uh, but we, we have to understand that there's got to be a worldwide leadership, and we can't focus all of our attention on one region. And I hope that the recent upheaval in the Middle East has convinced the administration of that. OK, well, let me uh, turn it over to our audience for some questions. Uh, uh, I think people are walking around uh, with mics. Also, I, I, I think I was supposed to say that you can tweet questions, or somebody can tweet. I, I'm, I'm the wrong guy to talk to about any of that stuff. Um, OK. Uh, yeah, sure. My name is Francois Brenn. I'm French, but I'm, I'm living in the States, and I'm proud to be part of the two nations. Um, we, we know, Mr. Levy, that uh, because you had very close relationship with President Sarkozy, you have played a key role into the action in Libya, and that's a great thing. And 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 we'll have the opportunity tonight to see the, your movie about that. Um, I don't know how close you are with current President Hollande. Uh, my question is to be very direct, because French people are, are not very well known to being politically correct. Uh, if today we cannot intervene in Syria, as we have been intervening with success in Libya, is it mainly because nobody can really pay the price? And I think it relates well to the theme of the day, the price of greatness. And in that case, nobody can pay the price because actually it wouldn't be a cash payment, but I'm put on a credit card, and we, nobody can afford that in the Western world, either France, either the States. It's probably one of the reasons, but uh, the price to pay will be much higher if we don't do. It will be a price to pay in terms of terrorism. It will be a price to pay, as Senator McCain said at the beginning, in terms of reinforcement of Iran. It will be price to pay in terms of uh, um, reinforcement of uh, Hezbollah and Hamas. The price to pay will be huge if we are not able today to pay the price of helping the, fo the fall of uh, Bashar al-Assad. And you know, about, about Libya, it's very easy today to say that it was easy at this time. It was very difficult too. It was a completely obscure situation. Nobody knew how much it would cost. The cost was much higher than it was expected. It took much more, many more months than it was announced. Uh, the victory was not sure. Gaddafi was not alone. Uh, the Russians were, did endorse at the beginning, but they very soon uh, uh, thought that they had been abused, and so on. So, it was a very difficult matter, uh, very costly, but I think it was a big cost to afford in order to avoid a huge price in the future. Same for Syria. If we don't do it today, we will have, as uh, the famous word said, the, the shame plus the cost in the near future. I think we could have accelerated the downfall of Gaddafi if we had continued to, do, to use U.S. air power. But that's, I, I, I regret that, but there's nothing that can be done about it. But I do thank the French and our British friends for the enormous effort they made. And I think the administration also deserves credit, is that we have provided a lot of the areas of support, such as refueling, such as uh, additional weapons, such as intelligence capability, many other things that our French and British allies and others did not have. And it was uh, that part of our contribution was really vital. OK, uh, over here. Good 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Bridget, and I'm actually from Arizona, so nice to see you again, Senator. Uh, my question has to do with more of the other parts of the Middle East. I think that, well, maybe not me personally, but do you think the world community is more hesitant to get involved with Syria because of um, the collapse of other states around it? So if, say, we intervened in Syria, um, what if there was a revolution in Yemen, which there were a lot of protests, or Oman, or in Iran, there's huge protests about the failing of their currency. Do you think that there's a possibility for the whole Middle East to change in, say, five, 10 years? Um, or do you think that this is more a motivation of, you know, Russia's playing a certain side versus the West? You know, your th any thoughts? I think as far as the United States is concerned, it's a war weariness is a big factor. Uh, people are very weary. Iraq, Afghanistan, a fear of getting into a prolonged conflict, which perhaps the United States might escalate and become more involved than initially uh, anticipated. It wouldn't be the first conflict that, that uh, escalated in that fashion. So I think war weariness, the economy and jobs, uh, but I also think that there is a rising amount of American public opinion that uh, want us to do something about this slaughter. I, re I really do. It's just a antithetical to everything that America stands for and, be and believes in. These stories are horrific. I wish every American could go to a refugee camp as Joe Lieberman and Lindsey Graham and I did. And, and hear the stories. They're just so heartbreaking. And I think I'm a fairly tough old guy, but it, it, it just breaks your heart. And so uh, I think there is some momentum. Uh, but every day that goes by, then the, the, the solutions are going to be even more complicated. And I guess it was a young one of the Syrian leaders that said, after this is over, just as you said, that we're going to remember who helped us and who didn't. And uh, the, this, this, the thing that bothers me more as much as anything else is this enormous influx of Al Qaeda and extremists that are pouring into Syria from all over the Middle East. It's going to be, makes it really difficult to set up. Uh, uh, look at the problems they're having in Libya with just the, uh, the, what they've got to contend with. But again, I want to emphasize the Middle East is changing and the world is changing. I don't think the Arab Spring is confined to the Middle East. I don't see how the Chinese can continue the way that they're that the way that they're on with this little group of people and all the corruption and all the ways that people have of communicating with each other nowadays and the ongoing scandals that that we see. So I think not only is, is there going to be changes in the Middle East? I think there's going to be changes throughout the world where people are going to want to assert and obtain their God-given rights. And I think that Putin's going to have difficulties in Russia. I, 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 and so, uh, and where it all leads, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I promise you that uh, two years from now, I hope we'll have the same kind of conversation and we'll be looking at a very, very different world. The question is, is what leadership role does the United States and our allies and friends play in shaping this new world that's going to emerge in the next, in the 21st century? Um, in the all the way in the back over there, yeah. The man who still has his hand up. Yep. That. Yes. Is that a man? Oh, I can't tell from here. No, female. If it's, if it's not, I apologize. I need to get these. Uh, and I, I, I want um, to add during the, in, in the meantime about the war weariness. It is true, but um, America, English, and French did a big job, even for example in Afghanistan. I am infuriated when I see in the press, French press and sometimes American press, that Afghanistan is a disaster. It is not true. We did a great job in Afghanistan. Uh, Karzai, Abdullah Abdullah, a lot. Uh, I was recently even in Uzbin and Kapisa. There is a lot of villages, a lot of cities where people don't want the Taliban uh, to, to, to be back. Uh, uh, the the pr American and, and special forces of French in Afghanistan 
pre uh, uh, um, allowed, for example, the, the chase of and the success of the chase of um, of Bin Laden. So, war weariness, of course, but we must not. Uh, let us uh, depressed by this defeatist propaganda who says that all that we did since 10 years was a disaster. Iraq was, a, was not good, of course, but Kosovo was not a disaster. It was a just war with a fair result. Uh, Libya was a just war with a good result. And Afghanistan, this should be said at this moment where hard decisions are at the edge of being taken, we achieved and you achieved, you Americans, especially real uh, results uh, which are good for the future of the, of the whole area, including Pakistan. I think Senator McCain and I would even add Iraq to that. But um, yes, um, ma'am, I apologize. Uh, no problem. Please. I'm Catherine Fitzpatrick. I write on Eurasian affairs. Uh, Senator McCain, I wanted to ask you a lot of focus is on the U.S. about Syria, but what can the U.S. do to pressure Russia more? They they supply the arms to Assad. Are we too dependent on Russia through because of, of having the route to Afghanistan where we have to get our uh, troops in and out? Have we well, become too dependent there that we can't pressure Russia sufficiently on this issue? Well, as was discussed earlier, the, the, the Russian veto is more of an excuse for non-intervention than a reason. We went to Kosovo without UN uh, Security Council endorsement. Um, I think that if there is a significant lack of progress, it is on the reset. You look at what Putin is doing. He just kicked out the NGOs. There's a new definition of treason. The, uh, uh, why in the world he would nullify the non-Luger uh, process, which is in Russia's benefit to get rid of nuclear materials. That, Every step he seems to be taking is more and more autocratic uh, and a kind of a ambition to see the old near abroad uh, of the Russian Empire. And I, I don't think that we're going to have another Cold War. I don't think we're going to have huge confrontations with Russia. But I think we have to understand that Putin is going to be there, or ambitions are to be there for the rest of his life and to have an autocratic regime that has a lot to do with corruption and kleptocracy. And I, that's one reason why I hope that, and I've been working as hard as I can, uh, the House has already passed it, that we would pass the Magnitsky bill. We pass the Magnitsky bill, and it sends a signal back to Putin that this kind of behavior is not acceptable, at least as far as the United States of America is concerned. Okay, we have time, I'm afraid, only for two more quick questions. Which, by questions. the way, as you know, is triggered by the rev uh, repeal of Jackson Vanek as, as part of the deal. Yeah, sorry. Um, we have time for two more quick questions, and I think I'll take the two, and then uh, you guys can answer them. Uh, this gentleman, and I'll cut someone from over on this side, uh, this gentleman right here. Yep. Very much. Flavius Mihaias. Um, Two questions. One on leadership. It seems that the uh, key missing piece of the equation today on acting uh, in, in Syria is uh, the French president has changed. Um, so, would you would you would you think that um, uh, President Hollande would have acted differently in Libya? And today, if we cannot have the leadership on the French side that we could have had with the different president, who could replace that uh, that uh, that leadership on the on the European side? side for instance um, number two I was a little bit perplexed by um, uh, mr. Levy um, um, consideration that the, the, the UN uh, on, on the moral on the moral principle we should act and the UN has failed I think that argument could be also used by other countries and non-democratic countries that would define moral imperative in a different uh, terms and then find their rational to invade other countries. And, and if you take a step back, the idea of the United Nations is also to provide some order uh, process on, on, uh, on uh, relations between countries and on interventions. Um, and very quickly, on the premises that the UN is unable to act, what other forums or what other uh, mechanism can we use? Can NATO, for instance, take over some of the, the role of the UN? And I think there's an interesting uh, 
possible difference of perspective between the Europeans and the United Nations. Um, an ambassador recently told me that the UN congressman or senator told him that he saw the NATO as a toolbox to solve problems. And I think the Europeans are more um, cautious about how do we expand the role of NATO. And so that how, how do you see that play out in a, as a possible replacement of the United Nations to find some legitimacy and a context to, to act uh, abroad? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And hold, if you could just hold off, let me just get the other question, and then we can. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Um, uh, Nelson Garcia with the Washington Intergovernmental Professional Group. Um, we are placed in a situation where Western intervention, while very positive and while very good in Libya and Syria, uh, I could see us in a posi position down the road where it actually backfires on us because the question will then be asked, why aren't we intervening, intervening in allied countries like Qatar, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia in promoting Western values? How do you address that situation and are there differences between our approaches between the two governments uh, besides the fact that one is anti-American versus one being a pro-American government? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee, why don't you answer this question and, I'll, and then we'll turn to Senator McCain to answer that question. About President Hollande and President Sarkozy, you are right. Um, in Libya, it has been in great part a question of persons. That is true. And it was amazing for me. I, I, I can bear testimony for a few episodes of this story. It was amazing to see how much these questions of persons, of who is in charge, of who does what, was important. And the film, which I hope you will see tonight, which is a diary of these 10 months of what was done, of uh, how it was done, how it was acted, shows that in a very clear way. The persons, the role. I remember when I was a Marxist in my youth, uh, we used to say uh, history with a big age, men do not count, they are just the puppet of history and so on. The proof is done definitively that it is the opposite. The men do history. When they want, where there is a will, where there is a courage to act, things can be done. And this Libya story is really emblematic of that. I hope you will, uh, you will take uh, consideration of that when you see at the French Embassy, I think, tonight, French Embassy, my uh, oath of the book. Number two, Hollande. The game is not over, and the, 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 the mess is not said. Let's wait. François Hollande was elected a few months ago. He had to take time to, to, to put his feet in the new um, uh, steps of a president. I don't know if Hollande would have acted as Sarkozy, but I'm sure that Sarkozy number one, the Sarkozy of the first year of the mandate, would not have done what he did after four years. The young Sarkozy, the, the new president, would certainly would not have acted in Libya as he acted at the end. This is to say that I'm not sure at all that François Hollande will not be at the, at the good level of acting and taking the lead. He shows signs since a few weeks of his ability to understand the question of Syria and to take the lead. One event which was rather unnoticed in America, which was his, his um, uh, uh, step in Beirut when he went to Saudi Arabia, was a great sign. This surprise stop in Beirut four weeks ago uh, to say, in the name of France, don't touch Lebanon, as Mitterrand say, uh, did in 82, as Chirac did uh, after the death of Hariri, was a, was a good thing. So let's wait. Maybe we will be, we, free world, and we, France, disappointed. Maybe not. About United Nations. I think that there will be, in the next years, a question of United Nations in general. I would advise my friends of foreign policy and of the, um, the um, uh, uh, think tank uh, directed by my friend Bill Crystal to put that on the agenda of the next month, the question of United Nations. This organization, which can um, accept that the Human Rights Committee is uh, directed by Gaddafi at one time, by Pakistan at, at another time, uh, that a, an organization of women can be directed and presided by a country which uh, uh, does not respect the equality and so on. 
is frankly problematic. So there is in general a question of United Nations. At the end of the day, you had the Société des Nations, which was replaced by United Nations. Why should not there be uh, an initiative coming from the civil society, from the government, uh, maybe, to, to make a, a new path, to proceed, to change the rules? This is one general point. Failure in Rwanda, failure in Bosnia, failure in uh, uh, so many uh, bloody wars in Africa, the forgotten wars of the 20th century, millions of dead. South Sudan, uh, Blue Nile, Darfur, hundreds of thousands of unnamed, without grave, without archive, dead with the absolute silence and indifference of United Nations. So there is a problem, problem of failure. And we will have to deal in the next years with that. Now, of course, to act without United Security Council cannot be a law. We cannot uh, uh, pose a, a, as a law that it should be done without. It has to be done very carefully, it has to be done uh, uh, modestly, and it has to be done as an exception. When you have an emergency situation, sometimes you have to follow a law which contradicts slightly the laws. You have a great, a great um, a piece of literature which is one of the founding stones of our civilization, which is Antigone. Antigone of Sophocle. And you have the law of Creon, and you have the law of Antigone. Sometimes the law of Creon is an uh, outlaw law. Sometimes it is an unfair regulation, and sometimes you have to stand against. This is what the American administration, hand in hand with the French and English administration, should do in front of Mr. Putin and his new autocratic regime. Well, Bob, I'd like to thank you and FPI for having me. Uh, you all do a, a great job. And those of you that haven't read his latest literary effort, I strongly recommend it. About has a lot to do with a blueprint and ideas and thoughts for America's role in the 21st century and beyond. Um, I think your question it touches on the really great challenge that we face in the 21st century. And as to where we intervene, where we don't intervene, under what circumstances, who do we support, how do we divert uh, and uh, expend our most valuable and precious assets ranging from American blood to American treasure. Um, I think, first of all, you have to, I think, view America as still the indispensable nation. Uh, the 20th century was the American century, and I believe the 21st century can be as well. But I think there's a fundamental principle that I believe in, and that is that our interests are our values, and our values are our interests. And how we pursue those objectives is really going to be shaped by the nature of the challenge. Uh, Mr. Levy just mentioned uh, Africa today. What's going on today in the Congo is, 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 is really just absolutely horrific. And yet the question is, what can we do effectively? Uh, you mentioned some of these other countries that are our friends and allies. We have to begin a process diplomatically of saying that they are going to have to show a greater respect for human rights, that they're going to have to sh show progress in the democratization, freedom of the press, et cetera, all the things that, that we believe in and stand for. Not immediately. There can't be an overnight transition. But we have to expect that kind of progress uh, from them. Otherwise, they will go the way of Mubarak, Ben Ali, Gaddafi, uh, et cetera. And there's always the danger. Look at Iran. Iran is the classic example of we got rid of the rotten Shah, and we've been paying a very heavy price for it uh, ever since. So it requires diplomacy. It requires understanding. It requires adjusting policies to the environment in which these various situations exist. And they will become more complex rather than less. But we have to base it on a fundamental set of principles, and that is that our values are their values, that our values are universal, that our belief that all of us 
are created with certain inalienable rights. And if we adjust those principles to the realities on the ground, then I don't think that we could ever really go very far wrong. When we go wrong, in my view, is when we look at the short-term situation rather than take the long view. And that's awfully easy to say uh, and a lot harder to do. But without a bedrock set of principles for a United States and European, and it got to be more and more allied efforts, uh, then we really don't have any blueprint as to how to assure a future of, an, of a globe that is changing in ways that I don't think we've seen. I keep trying to remember, I, as a student of history, I think maybe the Reformation in Europe uh, it, it was a period of upheaval, frankly, that, that, uh, that is a, a little bit comparable uh, to this one. But I believe in American leadership. I believe in the greatness of America. I believe that this president can lead. I believe that his secretary of state, whoever that might be, can, can also uh, lead. And uh, I think it's important that we talk about these issues because I don't think the challenges have ever been greater either. I thank you. Well, thank you, Senator. I have one, one, quick, one quick sentence for President Obama. If he were sitting here, I don't have a Clint Eastwood chair for you to talk to, but one sentence for uh, President Obama on Syria. It's time to intervene. It's time to lead. Please wake up. <laughs> thank you very much.